Thanks, Michael, and thanks everyone for uh, for having me here today. And it's a real honor and joy to see you all today. Um, like joy, queer joy, like um, like Chris has suggested, we should attend to um, be attuned to. So I'm gonna share my screen, and um, it's a it's a short talk. So I'm gonna be speaking quickly and presenting an overview of some of the findings of our study. Um, Michael um, is actually going to, like Michael is the next speaker this morning and he's going to present um, in, in more details on um, the impacts of uh, campus climate on well-being and mental health outcomes. Um, my task this morning is to uh, present to you on some of the, the findings related mostly to the intersection of climate uh, and academics for uh, 2S LGBTQ plus students in university. Uh, in universities in Canada. Um, basically, uh, without further ado, the key questions that I'm going to address in this, in this short talk is, what is the role of campus climate in students' academic outcomes in Ontario and in Canada? Like Chris mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, most of the research or a lot of the research has been done um, uh, in the U.S., uh, part, when it, I mean, research focused on, on campus climate and uh, for two S LGBTQ plus students has been mostly done in the U.S. So um, it's really uh, important to do more research in Ontario and in and in in Canada more broadly. And we've had the chance to work on two different studies. Uh, Michael, myself, and a, a large group of colleagues, wonderful colleagues and students, on two studies, including the Thriving on Campus study in Ontario, but also a larger study that I'm going to present some findings on today. Um, and we are uh, defining campus climate uh, uh, with two different dimensions. So there's experiential climate. So it's basically what type of victimization um, students have themselves experienced on, on, uh, on campus, such as microaggressions, but also uh, more, um, more forms of uh, other forms of hostility and victimization, such as uh, uh, psychological violence, harassment, um, physical violence, etc. And in psychological climate, is a little bit more broad. It's the perceived level of inclusion of 2S LGBTQ students on campus. So it's not necessarily experiential aspect. It's not that I, for example, I'm experiencing microaggression as a student, but it's more broadly to what extent do I feel that people are welcome on campus? To what extent are policies supporting 2S LGBTQ students, et cetera? So it's, it, it doesn't relate to necessarily to my own experience, but more broadly to the inclusion of 2S LGBTQ students on campus. So we're looking at the role of of such factors in academic outcomes. But also we wanna look at key protective or buffering factors um, at multiple level of the ecosystem. So it could be individual factor, but also organizational or social factors that can promote a more positive academic development for LGBTQ students, or that can help them deal with some of uh, the stressors that unfortunately they, they still are facing on campus. Um, so, like I said, it's part. Uh, I'm talking about two different studies here. One, uh, the two studies have been funded by SHRC. Uh, the first study um, is using the NCHA data, which is a large um, survey that's usually being conducted in the U.S. in different um, colleges with um, with students that are not necessarily LGBT, but including LGBT students. So it's any students can participate. And there's been uh, one, at least I think one or two uh, ways of data collection also in universities in Canada. The second study is uh, the Thriving Campus study uh, that Michael is gonna talk more about in his talk, but it's uh, the first Ontario-wide, very in-depth study uh, on the well-being and academic outcomes of 2S LGBTQ students. So going back to the first study, the National College Health Assessment Survey was conducted in Canada in 2016. Like I said, it's based on a US survey, uh, but um, it, we, we, it's really rare that we have a large sample like that of students who, um, who really complete a, a survey. So it's actually 40,000 students in Canada that completed a survey in 2016. Uh, and among these, about 6,000 students were, um, were uh, identifying as LGBT plus in the survey. 
Um, we are not in charge of the survey. I mean, the survey had been conducted when we uh, decided to do this study using the data from the survey. So we didn't have a lot of options in terms of what exact variables we were looking at or we were um, the way the questions were asked, et cetera. Um, just a few, a few highlights from some of the findings with that, that we have with this survey regarding victimization and academics. Uh, here you see a graph that represents the percentage of students reporting different forms of victimization. Uh, I'm going to go quickly, but the most important thing to see is that uh, when you compare LGBT plus students to cisgender or heterosexual students, uh, it's really clear that for the, all the forms of victimization, they show higher rates of experience of victimization in the last 12 months. Um, you see, especially for unwanted, unwanted sexual touching, attempted sexual penetration, sexual penetration without consent, uh, the rates are, are very high. It's almost for several of these forms of victimization, the rates are nearly twice or more than twice larger for LGBT LGBT plus students compared to cisgender heterosexual students. There were questions also in the survey regarding academic impediments. So different stressors basically that students uh, are experiencing and, and that are resulting in lower grades or um, incomplete or dropped courses or other, other um, negative academic outcomes. Uh, as you can see here, uh, LGBT plus students are more numerous like proportionally um, to report that depression, anxiety and, and discrimination and other forms of, of assault and victimization have been, um, that, that these things have been impediments to their academic performance and academic outcomes. Uh, and it's really concerning also uh, to see that when you compare trans students to cisgender students in the sample, uh, we, we clearly see that the trends are even more negative for, uh, for trans students. We see, for example, for physical and sexual assault and for discrimination, the rates are uh, five times higher for trans students compared to uh, cisgender students for depression, anxiety, and drug use as factors that uh, can affect academic outcomes and performance. The rates are nearly twice as high. So this, these are just a couple of uh, like snippets from findings from that national um, college health assessment data that we have analyzed. Uh, and we were lucky that uh, approximately at the same time we were doing these analysis with the national data, uh, we, uh, we conducted this Ontario-wide study uh, that Michael is going to present more about um, in the next uh, few minutes uh, at his, uh, his talk. Um, and, and this study is actually allowing us to go much deeper than the data uh, that, that, that what's possible with the data that was collected in the National uh, College Health Assessment Survey. So the study, you're going to have more detail later, it's, um, um, it's 3,856 to SLGBTQ university students in Ontario for 30, from 31 campuses, 21 universities. It's, it was conducted in 2019. There was a quantitative survey that I'm focusing on, but there was also a qualitative survey uh, later. We've measured different climate indicators uh, of experiential climate, but also psychological climate, like I said, the, or the perception about inclusion uh, on campus, and it's uh, something very innovative that's been really done, is that we included in psychological climate the perception that um, there is a good representation of 2S LGBTQ plus content in, in the pedagogical content in, in classes and, and class, class material and class discussion, etc. We've measured different academic outcomes, academic persistence. So have you had any thoughts about quitting school in the, the current academic year? Academic disengagement, so missing classes, um, sleeping in class, et cetera. Academic development, to what extent you feel that you are developing yourself uh, intellectually, academically, uh, that you are gonna succeed in your classes. And we've measured different potential protective or buffering factors that could help people deal with stressors. Uh, so grit is, uh, it's basically an individual trait of uh, being uh, persistent, perseverant, um, and passionate about achieving goals, social support, instructor support is to what extent you're comfortable talking with your instructor for advice, for, uh, for, for support. And finally, we've asked people, have you been participating in a student group or center? And, and if yes, to what extent do you feel it, like you feel comfortable being yourself in such groups? 
Um, a few snippets from the findings. I know I need to go quickly. Um, so when we look at what are factors associated with um, academic persistence or actually the lack of persistence or doubts about leaving, leaving your university, uh, we found for trans students and sexually diverse students, uh, more microaggression, more experience of hostility and incivility were associated with having had thoughts of leaving school in the during the current academic years. Uh, and for trans students, uh, more less inclusive policies on campus for trans students, including uh, including um, the policies regarding uh, not having policies on campus about changing your uh, how to change your name and uh, pronouns, etc. Uh, and for sexually diverse students, lower leadership commitment. So is the leadership of the university sh showing support or not? Uh, we see here that if, if there's lower leadership support or commitment to, uh, to SLGBTQ plus students, um, uh, it's associated with having, a having had thoughts of leaving school in the, 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 the current academic year. So we see that basically the climate plays an important role, different aspects of climate, an important role in, in, these, uh, in these thoughts of leaving school and, and reversely of, in, in, in potentially in um, uh, academic persistence if there would be a better climate. Looking at academic disengagement, uh, so having missed classes, slept in classes, for example, we found that more experience of microaggression, either gender identity related or sexual identity related, predicted higher academic disengagement. So it's similar to the trend we found with uh, um, giving counts about uh, leaving schools. Um, however, what's interesting is we found that there were buffering factors. So a buffering factor is actually a protective factor that kind of reduces the effect of, uh, of, of climate on the, uh, on the academic outcomes. So like we see here, microaggression play a negative role in, in academic engagement. So it's related to more academic disengagement. But we found that if people experience more social support from family, more comfort with instructors or comfort being themselves, uh, being comfortable um, uh, in, in a LGBTQ student center or group, then they are less affected by microaggression in terms of their uh, academic engagement. Uh, so these factors can help buffer the effect of, of uh, negative climate. And for sexual identity related microaggression, we found something similar. Uh, grit did not play a role in buffering the effects of academic, um, of, of microaggression and academic disengagement. Finally, I just wanna say a few words on the fact that for trans students, the experiences are also worse than for cisgender students in, in this sample on the Thriving on Campus study in Ontario. Trans students experience more incivility, more hostility towards themselves, and more incivility and more hostility is associated with higher academic disengagement and less positive academic development. So trans students face more challenges in, in terms of the of campus climate and it's associated with more negative outcomes in terms of their academics compared to cisgender students in the sample. Finally, I want to say that a positive psychological climate is also is protective though. Uh, for example, we found for trans students that a better pedagogical representation of trans issues uh, in, in classes and in, in, in either in class content or class discussion, etc., was associated with a more positive academic development, the perception that a person is growing intellectually, academically, is going to have success, is going to success at school, etc., uh, succeed at school, etc. And we found something similar for uh, sexually diverse students. Uh, we found that a better pedagogical representation is also associated with more academic development and more positive academic development. And we found that better collective attitudes and, uh, and treatment of uh, to SLGBTQ students on campus. Uh, more commitment from institutional leadership towards to SLGBTQ plus uh, issues uh, is associated with better academic development. So uh, basically initiating or instill creating a, a more positive psychological climate or ambient climate for all uh, to SLGBTQ students is actually positive for academic development, for their academic development. I want to say finally, in a nutshell, that um, as we see um, people are experiencing different forms of victimization and negative climate, and it as it seems to have impact on their uh, academic development outcome, persistence and engagement. So we need to continue implementing policies and programs addressing victimization and addressing climate on campus. 
uh, we found that although most studies in the past have looked at experiential aspects such as victimization, we found though that in, an inclusive ambient climate matters, uh, particularly pedagogical representations or inclusion of LGBTQ plus issues uh, in courses and in, in course discussion, etc. Um, I want to say that we found that there were a couple of um, protective factors in, at different ecological levels. So social support from family, support from instructors, um, being part of a student groups where you feel you can be yourself. These, are, these have been found in these analysis to be protective. So we need to leverage these aspects in addition to advocating for transformative changes to actually improve climate. And finally, we need more programs that specifically address the unique experiences of trans students, as well as other intersectionally marginalized students. Thank you so much.